Welcome everyone to another webinar. We are today going to go over preferences and Q and some settings and control panel and all that fun stuff. Towards the end, we are going to be discussing like template show files and how you can kind of use your show file to go from one kind one how you can use like a base show file to go from one show to another show if you need to. Um we do have, you can see up here, I have one upcoming stream actually planned. So July next week, we're going to talk about command the hog. Um, that's going to be like command line stuff, talking about our command line syntax and how hog likes to think. That way, maybe it can help you program a little bit better. Um, and then after that, we will have more. I promise this isn't like the last one. It's just we want to hold off and see what else can, what else we can actually um, do for that. I'm like I said, media, I said last time, media server programming is something that's coming up. That might be the next one. I am just in talks with some people at high end to figure out what we can, what we should do for the next, for the, some upcoming streams as well. Paul, do you have anything to add? Before we so, so, so they're like, so they're considered like TB, TBD. Yeah, exactly. TBD to mm. be determined. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to. And yeah, we're just trying to TBD it just be in case there's some new stuff I can show. Um, we would probably do that instead of media server or throw that in after media server, just trying to plan out a schedule to see how far ahead we need to go. Good times. Yeah. Um, Paul, anything before we actually get started with some preferences? No, let's jump right in. All right. Um, so I just want to start out with um, getting into the preferences and how preferences work on HOG. Um, so preferences are on a per show file basis. So anything you do inside the preferences window is only going to be inside the show. Uh, so the first thing to access preferences, you can hit setup and then preferences at the bottom here. And that's going to open up your user preferences. Um, so they are user preferences. So Hog does have a concept of users. Um, the users are only for, really only for preferences at this point in time. So meaning that you can have multiple users on the console. So me and Paul can be sharing the same console, but our preferences can be different. So the little buttons that exist below the encoder wheels, we can have that be different. Um, we can have our page change actions be different if we wanted to, or different programming set different programming options. So that's all on a user base if we need to. I'm um, just starting at the top here. Um, color scheme is slightly important and some people don't know you can change it. So for color scheme dark, that's what the default, that's what we've been doing this entire time. Now you can also make the color scheme go light and it is quite jarring on the eyes. Um, it's really nice in bright sunlight. It, whenever there's a lot of sunlight or fluorescent lights hitting the desk, it then can help break through the glare that occurs on the desk screens. Um, you can also do stealth, and that's going to look very similar to your default mode of dark. But if you notice, like your white background on the drop down, that now turns to like a nice dark gray, and same in like the output window. The output window is now instead of a white spreadsheet, it's like a nice dark gray. Again, just to help be a little bit easier on the eyes. In this case, in case you're in like a nice dark room. Um, there's also an option for on the consoles. If you have desk lights put in on, on the consoles, um, you can turn on use blue desk lights. And now the desk lights go from white to blue. This is really nice, um, just again, to help the eyes. And then also something to be aware of, if you have this box check, and you take your con your show file to a hedgehog, the hedgehog does not have blue desk lights by default. So that desk light will just turn off. So if you're on a hedgehog, just make sure that in your desk light's not working. This is pretty common to make sure your use blue desk lights is actually unchecked so that you get desk lights. Um, you can change the date format if you need to, time format, all that good stuff, sleep timer as well. That way you don't kill the the monitor on the console. Um, let's see. So next is your sensitivity and your key timings. I kind of talk about at the same time. It's basically how is the console going to react to the buttons that you're pushing or to your encoder wheels and your uh, your encoder wheels, parameter wheels, that kind of stuff. Like how 
Maybe they are reacting too slow, so you can increase that to make them react a bit faster. Um, same with intensity wheel, trackball, all that kind of stuff. You can really customize this to help you help the console be pretty much very customized to how fast or how slow you actually work, um, which is nice. Um, next thing down is your trackball. So with your trackball here, you can actually customize what the four buttons do around the trackball. Um, so full board four, hog fours have, and hog four eighteens have the trackball built into the desk. So you have that console with the trackball. You can customize what the four buttons do, left click, right click. Maybe you don't need left click ever. You can go and change that. Um, these are just what the defaults are to toggle your from position mode to um, normal mode. Or, and then you can also change what the scroll wheel does if you're in position mode. So you can change it from focus to any other parameter. Kind of like if you were editing a kind to just put it there on that scroll wheel. Um, sometimes I like to change, if I'm changing intensity a lot and I like on a hog four or 418, you have that intensity scroll wheel. But if you go down to a full bore, you no longer have that intensity scroll wheel. So instead of focus, you could change this to be intensity if you wanted to. That way that wheel can now control intensity when you go into position mode on the console. Um, now there are some, con there are trackballs that we support. Um, there are a bunch of Kensington models to where you plug it in via USB and then you can get full um, trackball parity. So for like roadhogs, hedgehogs, you can plug in that supported USB model of trackball and get the four buttons and the encode and the wheel around the trackball also. So in case you really want that functionality, you can get it. Um, the next one down is your programming tab here. Your programming tab is actually gonna be pretty important into customizing the desk into working exactly how you like to work. Um, the some the first thing I want to point out is the close on update. So when you hit the so if you open a queue list window or a queue window, a queue editor, you make some edits, you hit update, it closes by default. That window closes by default. Well, that's because close on updates checked. So if you don't want it to close after you hit update, then you can just uncheck the box. And now when you hit update it won't close that editor for you. Um, some people don't like the select all fixtures when activated. So in case you didn't didn't know or haven't really noticed, when you open a queue list or a scene or any type of editor, um, by default, all the fixtures that are used inside that object get selected. If you uncheck that box, none of those fixtures will get selected. Um, and then there's also the default blind state. So with the blind state is when you open a scene to edit the scene or you open a queue to ed edit the queue or a palette, you default into blind. You can actually make it instead of blind, you can, you can turn it off or you can just use whatever the current status is of your blind key right there. Um, the intensity bump buttons are pretty are good to change as well. That's these blank buttons above and below the intensity scroll wheel. So in case you want to go from 10%, every time you hit the button up, full, we're not gonna wanna do it. Uh, one second and I will show. Uh, one through nine, full. So using the bump buttons, we can decrease or increase by 10%. But with the preferences, we could also make this be an easy on and off. So like if we change our button delta to 100%, when you hit the bump button, it goes to full. When you hit the bump button down, it goes out. So that's just a quick way to quickly make a full and out button if you need to. Um, or you could just change it to whatever values you want. So if you know you're gonna be bumping from 25% a lot, you can have it be 25% so that you can just hit up, it's gonna increase by 25, hit down, it decreases by 25%. Um, and again, these are just really nice to customize. That way you can get that button working exactly, exactly how you want to. Um, then below that, you have the encoder wheel button options. You can see here, I don't have any encoder wheel buttons but on any of the hog four consoles or a hoglet or a nano hog, you'll have these silver buttons to on the bottom of the encoder wheel. 
um, right now it's a just by one. So when you tap that button, it's going to increase that parameter value by one. Um, that's really useful for media servers where you just want to hit one, go through the files one at a time. Or if you just want to nudge just uh, slowly through a parameter, it's really nice. You also have find mode, which is the same thing as holding down pig and spinning the encoder wheel. Cycle feature mode is useful when you want to beam. When you want to change like from going from index rotate animate for the gobo rotates if with cycle feature mode instead of having to tap on the screen to toggle between index rotate animate you can actually just hit that silver encoder wheel button and then it'll toggle um, the features the same way as if you were tapping on the screen itself um the confirm before options are also really nice if you have the deleting the directory items um, just if you're going through and cleaning up a lot of stuff inside the show file then it might be really useful to just uncheck that box anytime you want to delete a queue or a list now it's not going to ask you anymore um let's see here then we have the miscellaneous tabs you can see here that remdim is unhighlighted uh, meaning it's disabled. So if you need the rem dim feature, the remainder dim feature, make sure you uncheck the box and then and apply those settings and then you can actually use the rem dim feature. Um, and if you wanted to check it again, it'll disable and now you can't actually use the rem dim feature without enabling it inside here. Um, the front the front cue list and scene window when pressed is another common one. Um, that either gets checked or unchecked and same with the palette window when kind is pressed. Usually these are, are both unchecked that when you, when you press the color button, the color palette window doesn't appear in front of whatever you were trying to do. Um, so that might be something you like to turn off or it might be something you like to keep on and you might want to turn on the cue list or the scene window. Same when, um, so that way when you press choose on a master, it doesn't automatically bring up that cue list or that scene window. Um, and then another option that's really useful is that reset segments and budding on clear. So right now, that segments of three, no budding. If I clear my programmer because this is checked, when I hit clear, that segments is going to go back to normal. Now, if that's unchecked and I adjust my segments and budding, when I hit clear, it is going to stay there until I go and actually say no segments. And once I say no segments, then it goes away. So the reset segments embedding on clear is pretty useful as well to keep unchecked if you want to continuously reset your segments embedding. Um, and then the automatically show kinds masking toolbar. So when you press record with it checked, when you press record, this box pops up saying, what do you want to actually add into the cues or into the scenes or whatever you're trying to record? Um, it automatically pops up because that box is checked. If you uncheck the box, now when I press the plot record, it does not pop up. You just need to tap the button and then that uh, that masking toolbar is going to come up. Um, so again, it's these are just a bunch of different options that are can either help you or you might want to go and toggle to turn off too, to um, speed up your programming. Cool. Um, the timing tab, this is where you can go and change your default timings, like when you're recording cues, scenes, palettes, that kind of thing. Um, so this is just something you can sp can help you and your programming. I know for theater shows, I usually change my fade times for everything to like three seconds because two seconds is too short. And usually the person I program it for likes a three second fade time. So I can just go in here and change my three second fade time here. And then um, I don't usually have to go and update my queue timings a lot at that point. Um, you also have the naming tab. The naming tab is, is actually like, it can be really useful, especially if you're dealing with multiple people on the same show file. So what the naming tab can do um, is when you create a group, then it, by default right now, it's going to give you the group directory and then the number of that group. So like when I hit record and I press on a group in the group directory, it says group 50, for example. Well, if I put in here, Megan, 
and then I leave the and D and and N. I apply that. Now if I were to record a group, it's going to automatically put Megan before the group, before the directory name and the number of that object. So if you're dealing with a, again, I said multiple users at this point. So if Paul and I want to distinguish between who made what groups, then my user can have Megan before the groups and his user can have Paul before the groups. That way when he records, uh, that way when I record groups, we know that I made them. When he records groups, we know that he made them. Um, and you can do this with any of these groups, intensities, position, color, beams, all this kind of stuff. Same with basically any object. Um, and you can also change what that copy of label does as well. So if you maybe don't like that it says copy of and you just want it to say the original name, you can actually delete that copy of. I'm going to apply it, open the groups, and we'll see what that does real quick. So if I wanted to make a copy of group 74, I'm going to say group 74 copy to 89 and you can see it doesn't say copy of group 74 anymore it just says exactly what the name is of that object so by having that name of that object we can actually get it clears up a lot of that copy of and it get and it makes it a little bit easier to see exactly what's inside this group um, and again that can go for any of these labels here I'm going to get these back to defaults, apply. Um, any questions before I continue on through the rest of the palette? I mean, the rest of the preferences. I kind of haven't stopped to see if there were anything. I don't know <clears> there <throat> are, but. No, we're not, not yet. But that doesn't mean they're not, not typing right. right now. Wait, and, and just the course. There you go. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the letters and the labels to code things? Um, yeah, so the capital D is the directory name and the capital N is the number of that object. Um, the lowercase d and lowercase n, let's go see what exactly that does real quick. Um, preferences, Andy and N. I don't really know the difference between the capital D and the lowercase d. Um, I think this was some... Paul, do you know the difference between those two? I, it, that escapes me, but hang on. I know, I know they don't distinguish between capital and lowercase. Um, I just don't completely know. Let's see. No, I was already looking. Oh, okay. Um, because that looks the exact same as if I had done just capital D. Um, but the and O is specific to the preferences here. The and O is specific to the copy label because that means the original object, so it's going to copy the original okay. object's name. So the all right, you can okay, you can you can use specific tags to have different console insert text uh, into the name for you according to the directory name and the location in the directory. So as it stands, the the n lowercase d is the directory name. Mm -hmm. The n uppercase d is a is a dynamic directory name. Gotcha. Um, so if we were to so what what you mean by dynamic is if we were to let's say we were dealing with a palette and we were to move the color palette to the position palette, mm -hmm. and it would change from color to position. Correct. Lowercase tags are resolved once only um, when the name is applied. Um, while uppercase tags remain unresolved until the name is displayed, unknown as dynamic. So pressing set and entering the name of a color palette of color palette three as the lowercase d and lowercase n will assign the name to be color three. If you assign the name to be a you know the and uppercase d and uppercase n, the name will also be assigned to color three. The difference is that moving this palette to position four will automatically correct the name to color four. Okay. 
ah, that was a mouthful. Yeah, it's it's a fun one. So basically, yeah, it's it's all about you know does it, it's kind of like how does the name how does it retain its name or does it move to coincide with the you know the position you're moving it to mm -hmm. or the project file you're moving it to. Yeah. Um. Exactly. So it's like, do you want it to always just say color three, or do you want it to say when you move it color fifty five now? Um. Are the D and O the only letters you can put in there? and n those are the only letters that we have like short codes for so i mean i can type in here mw so megan wilson when i hit apply anytime i make a group now it's going to just keep those letters so we keep, we get mw group 93 mw group 94 so on um because those letters because i type those letters and those letters so if we were to put an and in front of it, they don't really do anything. So the D and O and N are really only there to give you those short codes. So again, D is the directory you're currently in. N is the place is the number of the object inside that directory, and O is the original object's name. Um and those and D's and N's also be careful because that also applies to the name uh, like name spot in your Qlist window. So if I go in here and I type and D and D it now says Q because it's technically a directory of Qs. I'll be honest. I've been programming on a hog for 20 years um, and this has been available since hog three. And this is the first time I've ever been asked or have looked at this in depth. <laughs> That's both sad and I don't know, maybe just sad. No, it. I mean, I usually don't play a factor into, I, I usually don't do a lot of these, but with more schools doing things, like with hogs going into more schools, um, people have asked, hey, how can I quickly label my groups so that these are like my groups and no, and like we know these are my groups. Right. Um, which is why I bring this up. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, great. Um, awesome. Then I'm going to keep going through here. We have the queue list direct the queue list preferences here. These are your global queue list preferences, so they don't they only apply to newly created queue lists unless you check the box that says apply changes to all existing queue lists. Then it'll go and apply it to everything. And when you check this box, it's not making this uh, match in every single queue list. It's only going to change what you've actually changed here on the queue list. Uh, so like right now, my Q, my fader, my Q list tens um, options have use HTTP checked and we'll say reset on release is also checked. So those two are the only ones that are checked. If I hit apply changes to all existing Q lists because there were no changes made, it's not actually going to change these options here. Or if I go and I actually chain check the is a chase now, I hit apply. Yes, do that. It's only going to make the change to that checkbox. It's not going to make the change to the rest of the settings. So that's just something to be aware of when you check that box. It's not going to change all of the settings. It's only going to change the setting that you change in set at that point in time. Uh, I'm going to check that and apply. Okay. Um. So some some preferences to be aware of inside your queue list, uh, queue list options, your playback priorities. Um, so whatever has the highest playback priority will win whatever queue list are seen. They both live on the same level. It just depends on playback priority at that point. Um, persist on override has to deal with stomping. So if this queue list were to get stomped out, then your um, then this queue list kind of just waits in the background. It lets others come and take the queue, the lights as needed, but then when that queue list that stomped out this queue, so when the queue list that stomped out this queue list 
is released, then this cue list comes back into play. Um, so it's just kind of useful if you don't, if you have like a list of a master cue list so that when you're going through um, that one set on persist on override, but then you have other cue lists that kind of want to take those lights into account. When you release that other cue list, the master list comes back into play so you don't go into dark or you don't lose your lights and you're basically you're not in dark is usually the reason that I see it being used out in the real world. Um, you also have release on other go. These are really good for like comment ma for like macro type cues where it's just a quick chase. And as soon as you hit go on some other cue list or scene, this cue list is going to be released. Um, you can change your default mark timings, release timings, all that good stuff here. Enable clock, whether or not this is being triggered by a clock. Enable whether or not it's being triggered by time code. Um, or if MIDI show control can actually control this cue list or not as well. Um, you also have the options in here for use HTP. So if you want this to be highest takes precedence or uh, instead of LTP. So basically an HTP only works for the intensity. So the, the cue list with the highest int intensity is going to win. Um, pile add effects. That one has to, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll show you guys what pile add effects actually does on a per cue list basis. Um, but basically it's used if you have like a position cue stack, you turn on pile add effects on that cue stack or on that cue list. And then on the other list, you have a bunch of effects going. So when you go through that effect, so you have an effect going, when you go through that, um, position cue list then it can, um, those effects will take the base value of whatever is inside that position cue list. Um, again, I'll, I'll throw up an example of what that means after I'm done kind of explaining these to the, the rest of the preferences windows. Um, reset on release is going to take you back to Q, to Q1 or whatever your first Q is inside the list. It is a chase. When you check that box, you actually get some chase rate, chase options here. It turns the cue list into a chase, so it'll all all the cues will just automatically follow each other. Um, and what's cool is you can change your direction. So instead of going one through nine, you can go nine through one. You can do random cues inside this cue list, inside this chase, or you can do bounce. So that's going to go one through nine and then nine through one, and you'll just go from one way to the other and just back and forth, back and forth, which is pretty nifty. Um, and you can change what your playback rate is then at that point, your crossfade, and your step length as well. Um, another useful thing that you may want to check, especially if you're doing Q uh, especially if you're doing like theatrical type shows or with a bunch of like intensity tricks, like where you just as soon as the light goes off, it needs to go and be in a new spot. So when you hit go on the next cue, it can turn back on and do all that neat marking stuff, is you can automatically mark new cues, either mark fade. So it's just going to listen to the fade time of the cue list or mark time new cues, depending on what you need there. Um, and then you have playback masking, which we'll get into and I'll show you as I'll show you exactly what this does as well. Um, but again, these are just global options. These aren't per cue list options. So whatever you adjust here are going to adjust in it. Whatever you adjust here will apply to any new cue list you make unless you check the box that says apply to all existing cue lists. Um, and then the same thing for scenes, it's going to be the exact same. So whatever you do inside here, it's going to apply to um, any newly created scene unless you check the box and that's apply changes to all existing scenes. Um, cool. There's also a couple batch options here um, and you can change what the standard intensity playback rates, all that does as well. Hey, is the... Uh... Is the release on other go um, in the same vein as persist, whereby um, the list only releases when another list stomps specifically on the conflicted parameters? No, it is on, release on other go means any time. Any other go. Any other go on the console. Yeah. yeah. Um, the console will automatic without persist on override check, the console automatically releases. And that's what stomping out does. Um, it'll automatically release when all the parameters are controlled by a different cue list. And you override and mark time new cues on a per queue basis. Yes, you definitely can. So even if you were to put mark fade or mark time 
is you um, so that when you record new cues, you can always go and adjust that on a per key basis as well. Um, and that is done inside your cue list window on the mark cell. Cool. Okay. So, uh, oh, can you set a release time in a stomp queue? That's just going to be your release time here. Yep. Whatever your release time is of the queue list, that's going to be your release time. Whenever you get stomped, because that's just releasing it. How do you stomp? Uh, stomp is just based on uh, when you, yeah, go ahead. You want me to take that one? Yeah, yeah, well, I was just going to say stomp is anytime you're pressing play on a second list or scene that has conflicting or, the, or you know, uh, same for shared parameters between the two lists or two cues or list versus scene. Yeah, exactly. So um, let me, one, three, one. I'll, I'll just do the example real quick. We have one three nine full inside the programmer. Um, we're gonna say, and I'm just gonna hit touch right now. Touch is gonna bring in all parameter values inside the programmer. Um, I actually want default position and B. Great. So we have the pictures on at 100% with default position, color, B, all that good stuff. Um, I'm gonna record this as another queue. So this queue right here, queue and shader number 10 and list number 10, it has intensity, color, position, and beam in it. Um, the queue in, in list 11 has literally everything in it. So because hog is an LTP desk, latest takes precedence, um, the last thing you did is going to be the last thing the console listens to. You. So how stomping works is if I go fader 9, it completely releases fader 10 whatever list is on fader 10 because uh, list 11 has all the information in it to completely overtake list 10. Um, so list 11 it has stomped out list 10 because it's released and list 11 is now controlling all the parameters that were inside list 10. So releasing and stomping are kind of the same thing. It's just the console auto. To, I mean, they're basically the same thing. It's just stomping is a. Um, it's just stomping. Stomping is just what happens whenever it is released via um, LTP. It's just a different term. But yes, Matt, you can release a queue list, and that is technically doing the same thing if you just choose the list and press release. Um, great. Are we, I guess I'm going to keep going then. I um, think we're caught up. Awesome. Yeah. Um, great. So then you have virtual faders and virtual faders are actually really useful to set correctly, especially when you don't have a wing connected like it. So this is going to be how the default of these faders are when you launch your show. Like if you were to take your con your show file from a real console, sorry, I shouldn't say real console, from a console to like a full bore, Roadhog, that kind of thing, to Hog4 PC without like a Hoglet or a Nano or any type of wing plugged in. So are these faders, like these playback bar faders, are they going to be pushed up or are they going to be pulled down? Um, so are they either going to be up or down? So you want to make sure you have that set correctly if they're pushed up. Um, just be aware for some HTTP that might execute them and ca cause them to go. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. That And then if they're pushed down and you were to hit go on a fader, so let's say I just launched a show file, it's down, I hit go, you don't actually see any lights because the faders are down. So you just want to be aware of what position is actually best if you were to be without a wing at one point. Uh, 
Um, and then you have some recording options here. So if you don't want tracking to happen on your console, um, then you probably if you don't want if you don't if you want to record like queue only and not make the queue list queue only, uh, you probably want to record check state to be turned on so that it records everything, including the queues that were before it. Um, it includes all your tracking that would come through. And if you don't want your tracking to carry on to the next queue, so if I made my lights red in Q1, when I record Q2, I don't, I have to, I don't want the red to be recorded or to carry through. Then you'll also want to take turn off track forward by default. Again, these are just defaults, and you can always change your recording options. Also, as you press record, all of these options also exist in your recording toolbar. Um, these are just what they are by default. Um, and then in the miscellaneous tab, there's some important options here. You have the startup macro option. Your startup macro is when you launch the show file, what do you want to happen? Maybe there's a warm up list that needs to go and you need to get in the right view. Well, then you can type in um, gl10 colon rv1. So it goes list 10 and recalls view one. That way, as soon as the show is launched, that's what happens. Um, there's also page change actions. So when you change pages, what happens? So if I were to hit next page or just change to page two, my command line is pro. Oh, it's in here. That's the issue. Uh, size programmer. There we go. Uh, page to enter. I get everything released. My queues that were currently going previously going on that page, they get released because my page change action is set to release all. Um, you could also say hold over if active. So that's if I go back a page. I hit go on a queue list and I bring the fader up. Now if I go to the next page, it's gonna hold over. I forgot to hit apply. If I don't if you don't hit apply, it doesn't change make the changes. Play, go. If I hit next page. That queue list gets carried over, and you can see it's carried over because it has the little thumbtack on it. Once it has the little thumbtack, that means it's being held over from a different page. It's a holdover if active is only going to carry over whatever is currently going on that page. Um, I'm gonna go back page. You also have leave in background. That means if there is a queue list that's currently going or a scene that's going. When you hit next page, it's going to stay going, but it doesn't clutter up the next page. It's still going to stay on. Um, let's see. Open full. Yeah, and those are really the main preferences in here. Um, you have apply and OK to actually like set the preferences correctly now at this point. Um, so apply is going to make the changes for you and apply them without closing the window and OK is going to apply the changes and also close the window after it's done applying. Um, so those are really the only two differences between apply and OK. Um, and then with user preferences, you can also import and export user preferences. So once you get these set up exactly how you like them, you can hit the you hit the export button and you can actually, you know, go and save them onto a flash drive if you needed to or wherever you wanted on the console. Um, that way, you can go and use these on other shows if you wanted to, um, either on this same console or, you know, take it to a different console. And then you can import the same way. You just hit import, you go find the preferences you want to import or add to the show file, click on it, hit OK, and now those preferences will come into the desk. Um, any questions before I talk about making a user? Um, cool. I think Paula got a, the comment macro question. Um, if you don't like opening the manual for to go find your comment macros, you can also just open any queue list or any yeah any queue list. Go into the macros tab, double click, and you'll get the whole list there as well. I'm gonna change my background back 
to my color scheme back to Darksville. There we go. Now there's contrast. Cool. Um, like I said, preferences are on a per user basis. So if you want to change your preferences, you can, um, or change your users. So like I said, me and Paul can be on the same console and have a different, a couple different user preferences set. Um, so to access that, you hit setup, and then in the shows menu, there is the users tab. Um, so here's your users tab. It's going to show you all the users you have in here. So I can make one for me. I can make one for Paul. Um, and whenever you add a user like that, um, so new user, or I'll just say default. Um, so when we add a user like this, it's just going to give us default user preferences. So it's basically like whatever we adjusted in those preferences don't get copied over. Um, so then when you want to switch users, you can click on the click on the user you want to switch to, hit switch, and it's going to say, hey, are you sure you want to switch the users? I'm going to say okay. And, and now the current user is Megan. Um, and then whenever I go into my preferences, we can see we're adjusting Megan's user preferences because it says Megan up here. Um, and I can make that stealth. And now when I switch to user A, I'm just going to go back to the... I'm going to say, okay, switch. It's going to go back to the defaults. Um, and then when you launch a show file, it's going to ask you, who do you want to launch as? Like, what user do you want to launch as? Um, and you'll just say, you'll click on the one you want to launch as, and it'll launch into those user preferences. Um, users are only used for user preferences. So there's no locking users out of the other desk, out of the rest of the desk and that kind of stuff. It's purely on a user preference basis. Right. Um, and that's what I have for user preferences. I do want to go and show a little bit more of what you can do inside the directory settings and the queue list option. But if there's, but we can wait a sec and see if there's any questions that come up. I know I just paused for questions, but we can wait and see if there's anything else that pops up real quick. Yeah. I just realized for a while there, I was talking the whole time and was muted. So. And you don't have a camera on, so I can't even tell you you were muted. <laughs> you guys missed a diatribe, and I'm not going to repeat it. Was it about the comment macros? Yes. <laughs> were you like, man, Megan's really just ignoring me right now? Uh, for a second there, I was like, wait a minute, I'm talking here. Hold on. That's <laughs> uh, all right. <clears throat> okay, I think you yeah, are not seeing any questions. Yeah. All right, so we're going to keep going and we're going to talk about mark queues a little bit just because of those mark settings that came up. Um so mark queues allow us to basically we have this light, it's here. We're going to record that as Q1. I'm going to go to 0, record that as Q2. And then we're going to go to full and point it somewhere else on stage. Or off stage, really. Anywhere. And that's going to be Q3. Um, so what the mark queue is going to allow us to do is basically preset our look if we wanted to. Uh, my fader is down. There we go. I hit go again. It's going to fade out. And what the mark queue is going to avoid is seeing this live move happen across the stage. Um, so you can always change your mark on a per queue basis. So right here, I can just, you want to apply the mark to where the move happens. So in Q3, I can say mark fade, and it's going to take the mark time. It's going to move that light in whatever your fade time is. So if I hit go, we're back in Q1, I hit go again, Q2. Once Q2 is done crossfading, it starts the mark. It's going to take three seconds to actually do the mark or however long that fade time is. And then once you see your either your mark time or fade is back in orange, you hit go, and it can, it's just going to appear up. It's not you don't see that live move across the stage. Um, now there was that option to auto mark, basically mark fade new cues or mark time new cues. So I'm going to check the box that says mark fade new cues. 
close the window here. Um, not, or sorry, that's five, five, enter. We'll make it go to zero. Record that as Q4. And you can see when I recorded Q4, it automatically added a fade time there or a mark fade there. I bring it up and let's go across the other side of the stage. Cool. And now Q5 is automatically uh, fade, has a mark as well. So I'll fade down. And then when I, oh, I didn't give it enough time. Awesome. Gonna go to Q3. It's gonna fade down. Marking's gonna occur. And when marking occurs, we disappear. And again, even though this was automatically set by the console for this mark fade, we could say, hey, I wanna, I wanna mark it as fast as possible. So we'll go zero seconds this time. Go to three time zero enter so we snap to q3 we hit go for q4 q4 fades down once that fade down is happening is done our mark is done basically and we go and now it just appears so you can override whatever setting was set inside the queue list options here um, so just because you mark fade new queues or mark time new queues you can go and change that if you need to um the next thing I wanted to show, though, was that mask playback for the queue list options. So I'm going to release everything. Cool. So we have this queue, queue list. It has a rainbow going across and some intensity, position, and beam. So what we can do here is, let's say I actually only wanted intensity and I wanted the color. Like, I don't care about the position and I don't care about the beam right now. You can actually just mask your playback. You check the mask playback and then you select what masking you actually want to apply. So you select what you want to see at this point. So intensity and color, like I said. So now if I were to release this list and then if I go, we only get intensity and color. We don't get that position in that beam. And you know mask playback is in effect because it has that little mask icon there um, at the bottom of the screen. And where it says full, you have that little mask icon showing that there is a ma there's masking occurring there. Um, let's fade or 10. So you can also just change your mask playback from here. If you just hit the playback mask button, you can actually turn that on or off. So I could say, great, actually, I do want position with this as well. I release the list. And then when I go to the list again, we now get position, intensity, and color still in there. We don't have the beam because I didn't mask in the beam there. So it's just, that's what the mask playback can do. It can add in or take out information as you need to momentarily without adjusting exactly what was recorded inside that cue list. Um, and then you also have the, going into options here, I'm gonna turn off mask playback, release it. And we're just gonna talk about HTP for a sec. So when you have HTTP set, highest takes precedence, you can then use the fader to actually control your intensity without going the queue if you need to or um, without adjusting the standard with the intensity fader. You, um, without setting that to intensity fader and having that go off zero or release at zero. Um, so with just the HTTP, it's highest takes precedence. So now your fader is just gonna control the intensity of this. It doesn't control the rest of the queue the rest of the information is only going to control the intensity of this list. So in order to get all the color and everything, I had to actually go the list. Um, and those were the main settings that I wanted to show here. Um, you can change a bunch of these options here if you want to like your name and all that kind of stuff. But those were the main settings I wanted to show with the queue list. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit into the directory settings before talking uh, about template shows completely. Um, so with directories, this is also something people really like to customize. Um, I am a fan of color coding my directories as much as possible. So we can see my group directories, the different types of fixtures are in different colors. Um, if we go into like my color directory, usually the color palettes match the colors that those are going to be. Um, that kind of thing. You can also change, just in the group directory, 
you can you have some options you can change here so you can change your um you can say if you want to color code the entire button so now the buttons just turn into outlines i don't like it but you know some people do um you can change your button size from medium to large if you need to or to small if you need to fit a lot more groups there you can also say whether or not to show fewer buttons so what fewer buttons is going to do is it's going to say how many but uh, is going to say if there's any empty buttons so like 10 through 12 is completely empty it's going to hide those so when i hit apply we just go from 9 to 13. if i turn that off we get that back and we get our nice um we get alignment back into place as well i'm going to take these back to medium and then the final option for the directory is your buttons across and that's how many buttons are actually going to be across in this directory um, so if I were to change this to 10, we get 10 buttons across. So you're basically setting a fixed width for how many for how many buttons you're going to see in that row. Um, so that's really useful, especially if you're taking your show file from console to console. Um, you don't want your you don't want your muscle memory to be messed up there. So when you go from a um, full bore to a roadhog and you have your buttons across set to auto, you're going to change how many buttons there are across changes based on how big your group directory is. Whereas if you were to just set your buttons across to 10, your groups are always going to be lined up with 1, 11, 21, 41 on the left. So you can get a muscle memory as to what groups live where. Um, and then what's nifty in other directories um, and in other windows is you can actually get rid of the um you can actually get rid of your your buttons at the top here if you right click so like with the beam directory if you don't want the ipcbetl to show you can uncheck that box for kind permissions and it actually gets rid of the ipcbetl turn it back and you have it back here or you can get rid of the directory objects as well or you can make it go completely away and get a little bit more space uh, again, that's just by right-clicking on any of the directory windows in the toolbars, and you'll get those options. Um, I like doing that for, like, the scene directory or the list directory if I am setting it up where I can go where it's kind of like a fixed install type of deal where it's a club that's just going to be running a bunch of different scenes that they have to put, do button pr presses on. Then I can in the scene directory or the list directory or whatever directory they're using, I can just go and disable and they can only see the options. Cause like, why do they need to see import export? Well, they don't, they can just turn that on or off. Um, and they don't need the chance to turn the guard on so that they don't accident so that they don't accidentally turn it on and then nothing's playing. So you can actually turn that off, record this as your view and then recall your view and those will stay off. Um, so that's just a little tidbit of information there that you don't have to have a toolbar if you don't need it. Um, and you can also change where the buttons are just by clicking and dragging on these this little dots here. If you click and drag, you can arrange the window and the buttons to where you want them, or you can have them be stacked. Put it back. There we go. Um, so those are some other things that you can use to like customize your show file a bit more. Um, that way it's looking and working exactly how you need it to look and work at that point in time. Um, cool. And I'm going to switch a little bit of gears here to like template shows because usually after you get all these set up, you do want to make a template show file. And that way when you have a new show to go into, um, you are actually just utilizing the preferences in the queue list that you've already talked about. The best thing to do is after you're happy with setting up your views, um, setting up your, so I have my group, my views here. They're all set up how I want them. I've set my preferences exactly how I want them. You, I will say, make a backup. You, at this point, you should be making a backup anyway, but you can make a backup. And when you make your backup show file, by going into setup shows and the current show and you hit backup, you actually get the option to give it a file name. So at that point, I would call it template. Um, and then I like to put my name that way in case someone else's template show file gets on my flash drive, I know exactly which one's mine. 
Um, and then probably, and then I might give it a year, depending on how many I like to make and all that kind of stuff. Um, but template. And then once you make that backup, anytime you need to launch a new show file, you just launch from that show file. Uh, you just launch from that backup because I don't, if you launch a backup show, it asks you to make a new name with that. Um, so real quick, I'm going to, so we can see my backup was successful. I'm going to log off here and just launch from a backup real quick so you guys can see that. Um, so you can, once you're ready to launch from a backup, you hit browse. Um, and here's my template show. It's, you know, it's a backup show file because it has this little safe icon. So the safe icon means it's a backup. The book means it's an open show file. Um, so it's not a backup. It's going to actively read and write from that show file. So we're going to go from the backup here, hit okay. And then it asks me to actually give the show file name. So now I can name whatever I want. So I, uh, uh, preps since this is the preferences um, since this is the preferences um, webinar here named it preps it's opening um, and it's extracting from that show file itself and you can name that show file whatever you want um, and once you name that show file whatever you want um, and it's ready to launch you, log you in. You choose the user that you are and you can launch into it. And so now I'm launched into that show file. Um, so this template show that I made, anything that's done inside that backup is done and safe. Now any changes that I make from here on out does not get, is not done. So if you ever need to edit that template show, you're just gonna need to make a backup of whatever is happening right then, right now. Um, but maybe there are cases um, when you just want the preference. So another case is instead of doing a whole template show, what you might just want to do is set of network preferences is just import and export your preferences. I pointed those out earlier. Um, just make sure you get your preferences exported. That way you can take those from show file to show file, especially if you mess with your sensitivity and key timings. You definitely want to take that from show file to show file. Um, just because then your the encoder wheels will feel a little bit different and react a little bit different if you don't adjust your sensitivity and key ti timings exactly the same as they were on the other consoles. Um, now, like I said, um, after you export and back up your show file, what you need to do is, and you don't, you want to make sure you don't lose them. Is I like to have it on a flash drive, and then I also like to have it on a computer. That way, in case the flash drive gets lost, I have it on my laptop somewhere. And then finally, I also back it up to like Google Drive, OneDrive, any of those cloud devices. That way they are there. They won't get lost, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so you just want to make sure that all of that is completely done um, and you have it backed up and saved somewhere. Now, if you're trying to take this template show file and use it, and I have a bunch of fixtures in here that are patched, and maybe they don't exist inside the show file or I need to change from like um, instead of Solospot 2000s, I have Solospot 3000s. So we need to change the type on them. We need to go from one fixture type to another. Um, that's when a good template show file is also useful because if you're going and you're changing fixture types and you're constantly changing fixture types, then your template show file, you probably want to keep with um, fixtures that have a bunch of of functions in them so like as many gobo wheels as you want as many color wheels that way your programming when you change type can apply to whatever fixture you change type to so like i have all that programming with fixtures with my spot 2000s well when i go to a different show file um, and they have spot 3000s instead of having to reprogram everything it'll just match real world value for real world value so my colors will match my gobos might match my pant my position might ma match uh, so usually a good template show file has the um, so a good template show file has the um, sorry has fixtures that are pretty generic and have a lot of functions in them so that they can copy to a lot of different fixture types. Um, with that being said, I'm going to open it up to Q and A now. So if y'all have any specific questions about what I just said, feel free to ask.
Um, I see one in here. Where are show files stored on Hog4 PC to automatically back up show files? Uh, documents. If you're running Windows 10, they're typically documents and then in the, the high-end high -end systems folder. And then Hog4 PC. And if you click in here, there should be shows. And here are all the shows. I would be careful with that, though, Campbell, is what you want in that case is to really only you really only want to back up a backup rather than the whole show file itself um the backup is a special like zip folder basically so nothing's going to get in or out um with those like auto backups or google drive utilities or whatever sometimes they don't grab files if they haven't been used in a really long time so like even if i take per, um where's one that i have adjusted recently so even in fixture selection, like not all the files are always touched every single time you open a show file. So you can see like this hog3 ident file was touched at 1.27 p.m. But the batches wasn't touched at that point. So they might cop not copy all the files. Whereas like, and then also you could possibly lose files in that case. So the tip that I always give is you always want to back up the ones that say dot hog4 show, not the actual folder folder. Um, is if I were to make a folder for only the backups to save to what they save there. Um, so the show files, when you make a backup, they default, like if I was just to hit this backup button, they default to whatever file folder the, um, show file was made in. So by default, it's that shows, or you can make another folder inside shows. And every time you hit that backup button, it saves to that backup. Um, what you could do is, and when you go to shows though and hit backup, it does specify, you can say where you want to backup. So I can say, make a new folder, backups. And now every time I hit backup, I click and click in backups, and then I can just keep making my backups in that folder. Um, so depending on how you do it, there's no like auto way, like I always want backups to go there. But if you do it the long way by hitting setup, shows, and backup, you can specify exactly what show file, what folder to save that backup in. Um, and then if you wanted to, you can go into your file browser and just actually manipulate the files to go wherever you want to. Um, good practice. So here's a good practice that we got. Make sure your backup actually loads before you take the thumb drive to your gig. Oh no, you learned that the hard way that every once in a while your backup file can be corrupt. Yeah, so just always, always, always make sure that your backup, you get that pop up that says backup has been successful, and then you um, eject your flash drive. Um, I haven't had that happen to me, Mark. That's really corrupt backup files, those are always the worst. Um, I haven't had that happen, but make sure, just like with any computer, make sure you actually eject the flash drive to make sure all the processes that were happening on that flash drive are completely done before you yank it out of your console. Um, when I change multi-instance fixtures, I get a pop-up that says can't be done. What is exactly happening during this? So I'm guessing you're talking about compound oh. fixtures like quad and hex. You cannot change multi, you cannot change type on compound fixtures. We just don't actually that's just not a feature that we have yet. Um, so if I were to have like a quad or hex, I can't um, if I were to have like a quad or hex, you can't actually like change type from a quad to a different type of fixture. You can then you what you need to do during that is actually do what's called compound explode. So when you add fix I'll add a quad real quick to show. Um, Campbell, any suggestions for some good fixtures for a template show that there's not really any suggestions. I mean, but like, let's say you work for a production house that owns X, Y, and Z fixtures. And that those are the fixtures you tend to go out with on shows. Maybe you add those shows, but in terms of like a general rule of thumb, I mean, that's about the closest I could recommend. Yeah. If you know what you're, I mean, like Paul said, if you know what you add, obviously have those, or like, if you know what the shop always has, have those. Um, is a good general work. I mean, you'll just want a fixture that kind of has everything in it is what, what I've heard suggested, suggested, um, the spot 3000 is a kitchen. It's a great light. 
it's super awesome. It has all the feet, fi- not to just push our own fixture out there, but it also has like three gobo wheels. I think they're th- all three rotating. No, two rotating, one static. Two rotating, one static. Sorry. Um, but like it has the full feature set. Like sometimes if you're just trying to do that and you can pre vis with whatever lights you want, then the, um, then it might be good to go with a full featured light like that, where you have as many features as you can. That way, when you change type to a Solar Spot 1000, they change. You get most of that programming in. For example. Um. Cool. So with this compound explode, so when you're trying to going back to uh, multi instance fixtures or or compound fixtures as we like to call them. Um, 701 and 702 is a quad. If I go to show details, we have 701 dot with our master dot one through dot four for cells. So we can't change type on this fixture because it's a compound fixture. So when you're trying to change type on compound fixtures, what you can do is compound exclude. And it's going to say, hey, you're going to exclude these in two parts. Um, that and your patch, your programming, all that's going to stay the same. Remembering is even the same. Um, just make sure that, just so you know, this can't be undone. Um, a tip is to replicate first. That way you keep your compound, fix your parts if you need to. Um, hit OK. And now you have your masters and then you have your cells as separate fixtures. So then you would want to, you would change part, change type on from the master to the master of the other compound fixture and then change type of the cell to the cell of the other compound fixture. Um, so those would be those would be kind of the steps. You compound explode, and then you change type on these specific parts that you need to change type on. Um, David Peck gave a great tip: make sure that your backup is not made on a console so- on a console with a software version later than the software version on your console. Yes, um, usually show files are not backwards compatible, so it's always best that your backup. Um, so you want to make sure that like your backup is done on the show file on the software version that you're going to be using. Um, like I know, I think the last one that was it was backwards compatible um, was the oh goodness I think I know like three nine hit a hard line. So like if you launch a show file on three nine, you can't take it back to three eight for example. Um, so just be aware of that. In the release notes, we always mention how far back your show file can go. Um, so just always be aware of what show fo- what software version you use to make your template show file or whatever backup you're using. Um, how do you explode a compound fixture? You would select the compound fixture and then hit the compound explode button. Again, it literally told me I cannot I can't undo it, so I'll just go add a hex this time. Cool. So we have our hexes in here turn off show details we have our hexes you select the fixtures and then you hit compound explode and you say okay and then you get your cells and then your masters in there um and that was yeah so comp so it's you have them in select your fixtures uh compound explode done Oh, that is also a good tip, Mark. Always bring a full restore stick of whatever software version your show file is made on. Because um, you never know when you run a console, it could be five software versions behind and your show file doesn't go back to it. And you have no internet at the gig. So always have two flash, I always suggest have two flash drives, one with the restore in case you need to put that, that uh, software version on it. And then one with your show file because they have to be two separate flash drives. Uh, again, I'm, I pointed this out in the troubleshooting video, but I'm going to point it out again is at support.etcconnect.com. If you go through here, we have all the software versions listed in here underneath Hog uh, Software and Programming, all Hog 4 OS software versions. And it tells you the last version that had show file compatibility. So if you make a show file on 3.13, you can go take it back to 3.9. You might lose some features. So like um, plots with the objects and with the show objects. 
but then you can but at least you can take the show file back so this um this website the support.etcconnect.com is a great resource and can also show you all the software versions that have been that we've released for hog4 i would also say programmers should always keep you know in their backpack a hard drive with all you know latest software latest and greatest software so that in a pinch you should always be able to create a bootable usb stick or get the software without having internet yeah keep everything as local as possible whatever software version you use i always suggest um, whatever software version you use so in this case 313 would be the latest keep that console full install file um, or if you're using hog4 pc keep that msi file or you know what just download both just in case be safe um because what if your console dies and then you have to use your laptop instead uh, just always these are the kind of things that you want to be prepared for um great and again, we're just kind of open for questions, whatever you guys want, any other tips that you want to give to your fellow programmers, all that fun stuff. Um, let's see if I can throw in some tips while tips and tricks on the fun part here. Oh, what can be merged? I mean, it's also useful to know, like, if you have a show file and you want to merge parts in. Um, so merging in, like, views and macros and stuff. So your view, you can merge in views. So if in your template show file, you actually have a bunch of views that you made. You don't want to merge everything into an already existing show file, but you want to get like your views in so your groups and your palettes are laid out exactly how you want them. You can actually merge that stuff in without um, needing to merge the rest of your show file in. Um, so to merge a show, you can hit setup shows. I feel like I just went over this a little bit ago, but you hit setup shows, um, current show, and then there's a merge show button. And when you hit merge show, you hit next, um, you go select the fixture that you want to merge the stuff from, hit next. It's thinking, oh, go back. Um, so if there were fixtures here, you could select them and whether or not you want to merge fixtures. So depending if you, and if you merge fixtures or not, depends on what else you actually get to merge in. Um, but one of the things you can merge in are your macros, so any keystroke macros you make, and then also any views that you make and any kinds that you make can be merged in without fixtures. Um, and then you can always merge those into your show files without having to have your fixtures also in the show file. Again, it's just useful if you just want to grab views or you have this useful keystroke macro that you need from one console, I mean, from this one specific show file, but it's not requirement on any of the other um, fixtures that are inside your desk, then you can also merge that in if you need to. Um, and if you're trying to speed up your programming, I'm going to reiterate like utilizing kinds a lot. Um, so I'm going to just hit auto kinds. When I hit auto kinds, it goes through all the con all the fixtures that are inside my desk. I can select one through nine. Um, and then we can quickly just get to color mixing if we need to. Um, go back. So by just hitting that color mixing button, we got cyan magenta yellow hue saturation. If I hit it again, I get saturation. Um, I can quickly get to my gobos. I can quickly get to soft to my soft edge or my focus stuff like that, without having to hit beam eight times to get to my focus and my soft edge, um, or uh, hit it eight times to get to my iris. For example, if I just click the button there for my kind, I get automatically tossed there as well um also inside you can also make custom kinds again this is just about making the console work for you um so like for one through nine at full it's pretty common that even though you have your fixtures 
you usually want to just pan tilt and then you might want to get like zoom in your focus on one per on one uh on one kind button so when you tap the button it just does that you can always record your own custom kinds so you hit record press on the kind key here open from your kind editor you you'll drag those parameters to that wheel that you want to control so pan tilt i said zoom and focus apply um and now i have that kind 39 if i select my fixtures i tap on that kind we have pan tilt zoom focus um so now i can move my fixtures i can zoom them in and out as i need to and i can adjust their focus without having to go between position and then beam five different times um so we can we can do the kind 39 and it just quickly takes me to pan, tilt, zoom, focus. Is there a way to is there a way to do something like pick a color on the color picker and then nudge colors? I've tried to do this um, with no luck. What What do you mean by nudge colors? Do you mean like nudge like the CMY to go from hue sat to CMY? Correct. Cool. Um. Yeah, it should be color. It, I mean, it really should. You just pick a color. You hit the color button. You pick a color from your color picker. You hit the color button until you see CMY. Um, so we'll take this orangish color, or we'll just take red. And then if you just nudge the wheel just slightly, it should just take you to the CM, to the proper CMY values. Yeah, um, but uh, but you also have to keep in mind, automated. but that but you also have to kind of bear in mind that you probably had no luck because Hog still considers hue and saturation mutually exclusive over CMY, right? So it's not it's it's the Hog is not currently able to basically pick a color from the color picker, nudge the CMY values, and then go back to the human saturation values. Yeah, um, so because they don't follow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. So you they don't track. Sorry. Yeah. No, you can't go he like you said, you can't go hue sat CMY back to hue sat. You can only go hue sat to CMY. You also can't go CMY to hue sat. You right. can only go one way. Um, it's just how hog works. Currently, maybe, maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I have the problem with custom LED fixtures, the colors pop up under intensity. Don't so my suggestion is don't use the custom intensity colors. Just use our uh, CMY and HUSAT or white for that. Um, because there's no way you're not going to get the hue and saturation colors to go to RGB no. because those are intensity parameters. Hog considers um, red, green, blue parameters. I red, I green, I blue to be under intensity um, 401 through enter um, because you're actually directly controlling how bright those red emitters are or how bright those blue emitters are. Um, so my suggest so my suggestion is stick with the color space that you like, hue and saturation or CMY, um, and program like you would any other light, whether if they weren't RGB fixtures. My also the reason why I also say that is because then you can copy the color that you have mixed wonderfully here. So I have this great cyan blue color here, and I can copy it. 401.1 copy to fixture number one and now fixture number one is in that cmy i can control i mean is in that hue and saturation color um so that would be my tip is don't use the i red i green i blue colors and i think most programmers agree with that tip just because again it, you would have to go from intensity to color and back and forth depending on the fixture fixture type that you have. I think we also have source four LEDs in here. I thought, maybe not. Um, or maybe they're just not patched. Source fours, yes, 601s. 
Um, and then for the fixtures that have the extra colors in them, so like um, Source 4s are great where they have the um, red, green, like the amber, lime, UV, all those extra emitters. Um, just be aware your color picker does not take those into account. So whenever it comes to those type of fixtures, my suggestions, ah, group 13, you noticed the group more than I did. Uh, and my suggestion is when it comes to those type of fixtures, put them in whatever RGB mode they have. Let the fixture figure out the smarts to make red correctly. At least I know with like source four fixtures or ETC fixtures with these seven colors arrays, they have the smarts in them to get that red to be red. Um, so that when you dial in red yourself, it's just using the onboard chip to make it red. But usually for those fixtures, like this is patched in RGB plus seven mode. So then I have the extra seven colors I can still go and dial in. Um, I've actually never tried to dial in the extra colors on capture, but it would work on a real, real fixture, not in the visualizer. Cool. Um, any other questions, guys, before we sign off? Awesome. Um, great. I'm glad, Blake. I'm glad, I'm glad you learned a lot. And remember, all of these go to YouTube afterwards. Um, so I think by like Tuesday-ish, usually they get put, they are for sure on the YouTube, ET, on the ETC study hall YouTube page. So make sure if you miss one, you can always go back and check there. Um, we try to make sure to, um, we try, we also make sure to, if there's any questions that come up on those YouTube channel, on those YouTube videos, we'll make sure to answer them also. Um, cool. Campbell had asked, are there any plans for extra colors in the color space? And I said, hope so. Yeah, I like that answer. Hope so. <laughs> um, if we aren't doing something that you want to see us do, make sure to request the, re put a feature request in on the forums. So forums.highend.com. Uh, make an account and request for the feature, and we can try add it to the back, add it to the feature request to see, and maybe work it into a future release. We're certainly always listening. Yep. Oh, awesome! Thanks, Blake, for joining. Then, twenty seventeen. Oh, that feels like so long ago. Doesn't it though? Yeah. Um. Just a reminder. To everyone, we next week we have our class for our webinar for Command the Hog, deep diving into this command line syntax, how to actually how the hog actually thinks on the command line, how you can utilize that to copy certain parameters from one object to another, all that good stuff, um, so that you don't maybe don't have to tap the screen screen as often, um, and then the rest are TBD. We are not done after July 30th's webinar, as far as I'm aware, we're not done. Um, I think the plan is to still keep these going. Um, so we're still going to keep going. It's just they're kind of TBD on whether I show upcoming features or if I show if, or if we just continue on how to program. Um, I do want to do a I do want to do a media server. It's in the works on me constructing some kind of media server overview. Um, it's just I don't know where exactly this fits in yet into the plan. Um, as usual, though, please fill out the survey, or if we didn't cover something that you want to see cover, make sure you fill it in the survey. If the survey doesn't pop up, shoot an email to support at highend.com, and we'll make sure to get the topic added as a as something to cover. Uh, Paul, anything before we, we're done? No, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for watching and following along.